Hello, everyone. Welcome to one more session of Eden webinars, Education in Time of Pandemic, uh, or called uh, e-learning online together. Uh, today, we have our final uh, webinar, final session before the summer. Uh, this is our 11th webinar, and it's titled Developing 21st Century Skills for Teaching Online. Uh, opportunities and challenges. And I'm very happy that today with me, I have two professors who are going to talk about digital skills. Uh, with me today is Assist Associate Professor Palita Ederinstingwa and Professor Ulf Daniel Ellers. And at the beginning, I will let them introduce themselves briefly and then we will start with uh, presentations. So please, Palita, please can you introduce yourself shortly? Uh, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, my name is Palita Edrisingha. I work at the University of Leicester in the School of Education. Um, so I, I, I work on uh, distance education, e-learning and international education. I'm really happy to be here and especially uh, to talk to you and talk to you about um, 21st century skills today. Thank you. Ulf, please, can you sell, say something about yourself? Hello, yes. Um, great to be here with you all and to speak out into the world of uh, learning and to share a few thoughts. My name is Ulf Ehlers. Uh, thank you, um, Sandra, for introducing me. I'm very happy to be here with uh, my colleague Palita. Uh, I'm working in Germany in a university in the south, the biggest university in the south of Germany. I have been there the vice president of academic affairs and tried to turn the ship a bit into the online learning and e-learning direction. I have uh, founded a couple of companies and uh, uh, since three years um, uh, are heading a research group on Next um, Education. That's how we call ourselves. And for the past uh, yeah, three, four years actually have uh, chaired a research project on future skills, which I will talk about and report about from uh, today. Thank you, Ulf. And um, just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Sandra Kuchina, I'm Eden President, and I work at the University Computing Center, University of Zagreb, and I wish to say hello to all my colleagues here today as a participant. Um, and now, um, well, we will start with presentations, but just before, uh, please, you can ask your question here in Q&A. Uh, not in the chat, but please use Q&A for the questions. And we will try doing, during, during the session to answer all your questions. But now for the start, let's have the presentation, which will be introduction presentation into our session, so that you get some ideas and some uh, overviews on digital skills um, and uh, such as such, but also as the digital skills which uh, have been acquainted uh, and developed during uh, this time of pandemic and uh, uh, working online. So Palita, I'm giving floor to you for your presentation. Let's hear your point of view on these digital skills uh, through teaching online. Thank you very much, Sandra. So, um, so we are talking about today um, uh, developing 21st century skills through um, how we might use teaching and learning methods, especially online uh, methods. And also um, in this uh, part of the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about um, opportunities and challenges as well. Um, so I think, uh, so these are the three questions I think that were on the Eden website, uh, webinar site, uh, in terms of our main focus. Here, what I will uh, try to do is I'll try to bring some examples from our international teachers in terms of how they 
have been trying to use um, current situation, um, kind of online uh, lockdown learning um, situation, how they try to do, um, try to encourage their students to develop 21st century skills. Um, I think it's quite important in a way to think about what is happening now, uh, whether it is um, homeschooling, distance learning, online learning, or is it something else? Um, because um, all of the other things have a rich tradition of um, literature, but I think what is happening now is um, a little bit different. Um, it's not really home learning because homeschooling, because homeschooling, in homeschooling situations, children can go to things like museums um, and meet their friends and so on. So um, I think it is really, we really need to think about what's happening these days and how we can really conceptualize the learning that's going on um, in the current situation. Um, there are some challenges in terms of um, learning, teaching and learning happening in these days. Um, these are some of the uh, reports I have used to, to look at um, um, more recent reports, um, a, a report came from Institute of Physical Studies say that um, better off children are studying better or more than poorer students. And also um, a report from Sutton Trust in the UK say that there is a widening and deepening inequality happening as well. Um, so I, I think uh, we need to really think about the mm -hmm. Uh, while we think about the potential of uh, technologies, we also need to think about um, the challenges as well. Um, so I'll, I'll look at um, somewhat a critical look at critical view of um, the idea of 21st century skills. So this is from a paper published in 2015, um, where the author, somebody called Greenlow, was looking at the idea itself, the 21st century skills, the notion of what we mean by 21st century skills. So he's got um, a number of critiques of this particular idea. So it, it, it is coming from big business and um, quite connected to technology and, um, and, and so on. So I think it's really important for us to think about if we want to bring our teachers together with us we need to think about the idea of 21st century skills itself in a more critical way. Um, whether when we think about in a particular way, 21st century skills, whether it will, it is really leaving some of the skills like social emotional skills, um, children's moral development and cultural identity formation, formation whether those can we are leaving those kind of things behind. Um, this is a um, keynote address by uh, Richard Noss, um, who was at um, uh, Inst uh, Institute of Education in London, uh, where he was looking at the idea of uh, 21st century skills uh, and, the, and 21st century learning. So I think there, are, there, there is a rich tradition of literature uh, that we can use to look at the idea of 21st century skills and, and to synthesize. Um, um, so uh, looking at the different kind of um, way people look at the 21st century skills, um, one of the critiques of the idea is that it is a, the, having a century specific label is misleading. Um, so what we might call in about 20, 30, 40 years ago, whether we will still call these 21st century skills is something we need to think about. And also um, the, the second bullet point on the right hand side of your screen, um, th this is a, from a, a report by two, two authors in 2009. Uh, what they say is there is a focus on work related competencies. Uh, this is an OECD report um, at the expense of more holistic development. And also there is a overlap or rather a um, compilation between the 21st century skills and, and digital competencies as well. While there is a inevitable link between the two, I think we, we really need to think about what we mean by 
um, 21st century skills. Um, so on the, the other side of the screen, I have tried to synthesize what we mean by 21st century skills. Uh, it's really looking at the process of children's learning, students learning rather than actually the product. Um, and also things like how to think critically, analytically, and trying to take control of their learning. I think that sort of things. Although these kind of things can be done quite well using technologies as well. Um, um, so it is about giving young people uh, the chances and opportunities to develop creative capabilities and in a rapidly changing world of uh, where there are a lot of uncertainties and challenges. And these uncertainties and challenges are, uh, if anything, are increasing as well as we know uh, what's happening these days, how we live and work. Um, and in terms of moving on to um, looking at the ways in which can we might be able to um, encourage teachers to um, help their children to students to learn uh, 21st century skills. One of the ways when I was looking at the our international teachers on our programs, uh, quite often um, they come up with the idea of project-based learning, uh, which is grounded in educational thinkers like uh, Dewey and uh, quite early educational thinkers as well. So um, it, it's an innovative approach. I'm sure a lot of the participants um, on, uh, listening to or watching this uh, webinar are quite familiar with um, how teachers um, give control to students to guide their or navigate their own learning process, regardless of the age and um, um, other um, conditions. Um, helping students to develop learning, learning to be self-reliant through uh, self-organization, a lot of social learning happening as well. Um, so uh, this, this article I have cited in, um, published in 2010, is really a good um, source to look at. There are other uh, literature as well, so I have listed them at the end of the presentation. So from this point onwards, I'm going to talk about the experience of two international teachers who shared their experience with me last few uh, weeks. Um, they, are, they are course participants on our MA International Education Program. Um, so this is very much their experience of um, using approaches and using obviously technology these days and then the, the kind of evidence of um, developing, helping students to develop their um, uh, their 21st century learning skills. So um, from the very much teach initiated activities, week one, starting with uh, Google Classroom and trying to connect to previous week's work. And from week two onwards, they, this particular teacher really um, started to use project-based learning activities. Um, so um, when I ask the teacher, why did you think it was important to use project-based learning? What she said was, because that is the way I teach and that's my philosophy of teaching. Um, I don't like teaching like I have all this information and I can read this to you and you can learn this. Uh, it is not the way I teach. So I think one of the important uh, points here is the teacher's philosophy of um, what teaching and what learning is, is quite important uh, in this context. Um, so um, what she said was um, she's getting the students to um, identify a topic. In this case, the topic is survival. And then students are building a small shelter, building a water cooling system. They all do their in their gardens. But I think quite important thing is how they use online methods uh, to collaborate online, for example present their findings via um, PowerPoint presentations, and also having lots of um, uh, online activities uh, happening throughout the day. Um, so these are some of the examples that she shared with me. Um, so children do these um, activities online together with other uh, children. These are primary school children as well. So it's quite amazing and if you look at it. Um, so there is another one. Um, 
So the second example I'm going to share with you is from an international teacher in Switzerland. Um, he is somebody who took, um, uh, led the school uh, to move on to online teaching um, over a one week period when they knew the school is going to be going to close and they have started their schools recently. Um, so he said, he, he made it abundantly clear that it, this is our opportunity to really go and develop those skills that we wish everyone had. So in um, the uh, in the groups he was working with, he tried to convey the idea that um, try not to do the things you normally do um, in classroom, in face-to-face. -face. You can do things uh, really differently. Um, and uh, so this was something they, they took a week to prepare. Um, all of that work happened and during the after the children left, left went home, uh, the remaining time they worked with groups. Um, so their experience was that they realized that um, within a week or two, students um, began to um, work online and uh, share them uh, share their work using videos, and then uh, the teachers uh, eventually within a very short period of time, were able to take a step back. Um, and then, um, the, like uh, when we work these days, um, we, work, we use Microsoft Teams and they use Microsoft Teams as well. And um, so students are working together. They are doing their own work, but they are talking to their friends as well. Um, so this is uh, very much the way the teachers have developed their activities in the classroom. Um, so here in this slide, he, 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 he's talking about um, the, tr the kind of messages he was trying to get across to his colleagues in, in the school in terms of how we can really change the way we teach. Um, and this is really a good opportunity uh, and so on. And then when I asked him about, do you have any examples? Um, he, 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 he he talked to me quite a lot of uh, the kind of examples. Um, so I'm going to, um, one of the things he was saying was that uh, giving the control to students in order to uh, give them the uh, opportunity to organize their work. So all they did was they gave them a plan for the week and some students were doing one project or one subject a day, Monday, something, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. And the others had spent one week, one hour a day, and so on. So uh, all, they, all they need to do is to, they will take a step back and try to uh, monitor what's going on. So in this example, uh, this is one of his students. Um, for one of the assignments was to create a news report. So um, she, the student, a primary school child, uh, got her parents involved as well, and the parents um, acted as the anchors. Um, so they started the anchoring, um, the little broadcast um, program, Welcome to Today broadcast, and then um, they said, uh, let's go to our reporter in the field. And the child went around the house and um, started talking about the kind of things that are contributing to the global worm, worm, warming, um, things like um, palm oil products in the fridge and uh, the two cars outside and the electricity and, and so on. So in a way, he was very enthusiastic about talking about this particular example. And he said, there are a lot more examples like this. Um, so um, the, um, and also one of the things he, he, he said was this kind of things would not be even if their their general philosophy of teaching is similar to this, it is not. It won't be possible to do this in the classroom because in this case, students are learning um, the skills, learning the content um, at home. So trying to use the home environment to the full extent. Um, um, so he, there are there are a lot more he shared with me in terms of um, the kind of philosophy in terms of developing students. Uh, 21st century skills. So one of the things that uh, came uh, quite frequently was the idea of communicate, talking about things, uh, getting children to share their ideas, and then uh, using um, videos, uh, video conferencing methods these days 
happening and now they have started their school back in the normal way but then the now they are thinking about how they can uh, capture the all the good things happened these days in terms of developing 21st century skills um so um so these are two examples there are quite a lot of other examples as well where everything went on very well but there were uh, quite a lot of the time again it de all depends on the uh, teacher's philosophy of what learning is what teaching is and so some of the examples are where the the teachers will take a quite a safe route if you like where trying to teach content and getting them to students to listen and um do some tests and then um trying to see what how 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 best to manage the situation but there are other teachers like the two examples i um shared with you where they have taken a little bit more innovative approach and um and they have a very good idea of what 21st century skills is and 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 as well but they were not the teachers who were interested in technology um in general they were not really interested in technology as um well let's say too much um on our program we have a technology pathway they were not the ones who were specializing on the pathway they were specializing in more like innovative approaches to teaching and learning so i think that is quite important um so um in a way the final remarks um i think it is important to develop a critical view of what we mean by 21st century skills and identify a good pedagogical method and i think as teachers um through teacher training i think a lot of us have that kind of an idea and then creating a learning environment where students can develop their future identities as um moral agents responsible citizens and lifelong learning and um, this is a long quote i have taken from green laws um, paper and what they say is let's take um, let's let us move cautiously and then try to um capitalize on good pedagogy that we we know uh, we've been developing um and so i think that is the end of my part of the presentation so i just want to show you the last slide so these are the two teachers who contributed to the um uh, this talk this presentation and i've got few useful videos as well and the list of references so um thank you very much i think i have um uh, yeah i i i i hope i haven't run out of time so thank you no, very much thank, thank you palita thank you uh we have a question here uh, for you from dr lasling kalsa does education mean just, just transfer of information from one source to another by any method what about other aspects of education is online education work enough what would you say <laughs> right thank you very much so yeah that's really an important question um i'm sure some of those uh, can be tackled um by uh, ulf as well my colleague so um yeah i i i think um education is not really transferring um information from one source to another one person to another i think we know it's it's, it's really uh, requires some kind of a synthesis some kind of a developing understanding by the person who is involved other people um, students involved in learning as well um there are certain things perhaps um important in the way if you like uh, transferring so i think uh, sometimes we need to know facts um because um uh, facts i think learning facts through some sort of understanding i think if you, if you go to a hospital if the doctor has to a uh, search google all the time i think that 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 can be a little bit um worrying i think they um they they need to know certain things but um but not no certainly education is not transferring facts or information from one source to another um it it it's something that um happens through a process of um developing an understanding a personalized understanding um yes online methods are useful um especially these days and um, there isn't any other way as well 
Um, I mean, in the UK, we are, we are dealing with this situation at the moment. Teachers are talking about how we can do it. Um, so we are in a situation where actually we can test it, whether how to what extent we can do it better. Um, but uh, we can also use online methods to transfer information. I think I know, unfortunately, a lot of the time that is what's happening as well. But there are good examples as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Farlita. We should always look for the good examples. Yeah, that's important. Uh, well, um, please uh, look at some questions in the question and answer uh, uh, box while we move to Ulf. Um, Ulf, please, this is time for your presentation. You have been doing very thorough research for the last three years uh, regarding the digital skills, future digital skills. So please, can you share your view on 21st uh, century skills through online teaching? Uh, uh, I need to unmute my microphone. Now everything should work. So thank you very much. Uh, that has been a really fascinating talk. Um, I have been uh, vice president of my university for six years and I was always fascinated when I went to the teachers and to the professors uh, in our seminar rooms and lecture halls and saw how creative they actually were and uh, how, how actually the best method to really innovate education from the bottom up is to go there and to learn from them and to, um, in a way, widen uh, and spread and disseminate what they do and not only to think about top-down new innovation programs. So... Um, uh, that was really fascinating. Thank you very much, Peneta. I'm currently spending time here, and that's also a result of the COVID-19 online, um, new online cultures. I'm currently spending time on the beach. This is a picture uh, from last night in a German island. Uh, many people don't know that we have even islands in Germany. We have islands in Germany. They're quite nice, actually. Uh, when I'm going to work, I'm working here in Baden-Württemberg, which is a small state, one of the 16 states in Germany. Uh, you can see here in red. And I'm working for a university called uh, Baden-Württemberg Cooperative State University, and we are the only state university in uh, Germany uh, and have 13 locations uh, based throughout the whole state uh, and um, are quite fairly big, actually. When COVID-19 hit, we had to move suddenly from one, one day to the other, 35,000 students online. That was really, really a challenge. Um, and also 780 professors, uh, uh, colleagues online, uh, more than 6,000 part-time lecturers uh, in our uh, nine main campuses, space, basically. Uh, and suddenly everything had to uh, function. Uh, we did that fairly well, I found, uh, but I have to say that uh, unlikely, unlike the discussions we have often around the uh, tables when we are planning online learning, what we saw here in our live big experiment um, of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, technology remains a hygienic factor. It is not unimportant, but even if we really invest in it, uh, it's not going to lead to a greater education satisfaction. This, I think, is a really, really important first learning of the COVID-19 crisis. My main message of my talk today is um, that while we are talking about COVID-19, uh, in many, many countries and institutions, uh, about a challenge of space, it might be a different challenge. We are using vocabulary to describe our current challenge, like digital process, digital transformation, remote learning, distant learning, online learning, virtual learning. Uh, so the whole metaphoric world of terms we are using actually uh, is describing that we are facing a challenge of space. We cannot meet physically anymore. We have to meet online. And all of our challenges are coming uh, from this situation. However, I believe rather, and that's actually my main message, uh, that COVID-19 is actually showing us 
that we are facing a clash of teaching and learning cultures. We are currently on a large scale trying to put face-to-face -face traditions into online learning. Face-to-face -face traditions into online learning. We have what I call the synchronous reflex. We are suddenly trying to give live lectures to all our students uh, and colleagues from all over the world. I know that sometimes this is the only thing we really can do. And when I say to you that we have 780 colleagues in my university, uh, of course, um, going online from one day to the other, uh, COVID-19 is not making um, edu higher education professionals online learning and teaching professionals. But that's actually the main message that I think the clash of teaching and learning cultures is becoming very, very uh, apparent now when we are trying to put face-to-face -face traditions into the online world. So the big question really, and that's where I come to the future skills, and I'm very happy about what Palita um, uh, uh, talked about, uh, is how can we actually use this crisis, this moment of crisis? Crisis is always a moment when we take distance to a process, to an intervention, to, to a system. Yeah, That's the crisis. It doesn't work anymore like we, we wanted it to be, like it usually used to work. So this moment of crisis can also show us and can give us an opportunity to look ahead and to um, clearly paint the picture of where do we want to go in the future. Should it be only a digital turn which we are looking at, or is also something larger on stake? Um, and of course, COVID is just one example we are having. We are facing uh, other challenge scenarios with the climate crisis, migration, globalization, digitalization, and so on. So, there are many, many um, emergent scenarios ahead of us, which are actually telling us, telling us that we need to um, take a larger view, a larger angle, and that we are really uh, need to try to crystallize what is actually the innovation push we need to look at. In the last years, we have done a lot of year, uh, a lot of research. Uh, about uh, future skills for future graduates. Uh, and you can go to our website. We have created a portal just started in, uh, in March now. You can go to the website and you can um, have a look at all our findings there. We have published uh, our main publication just recently in uh, German Open Access and in English Open Access. So feel free and go there and download uh, your personal copy. The future skills work which we did um, is based around uh, a set of research studies. These were um, analysis, scientific screenings of um, organizational uh, human resource development concepts. Uh, also in-depth interviews with um, responsible leaders in organizations uh, and also Delphi studies um, with uh, an international Delphi panel, which we conducted in 2017, 18 and 19. And we were always asking, what do you think are the future skills which your organization's members or which society, citizens of today's societies need to meet tomorrow's challenges. And the second question we were asking was, so what, in your view, should universities, should higher education institutions do uh, in order to prepare graduates for that? And what we found there is that there are actually three big spheres of change. The first big sphere is that the nature and dealing with knowledge will drastically, dramatically change in the future. It will be much more about designing and much more about critical reflecting than learning by heart and 
um, reproducing knowledge. Yeah? So this attitude and this aspect of creative development of the new of the new knowledge will be very, very important. The second sphere of change is that education will turn more and more into a flexibilized, personalized, individualized development pathway. And the success of our institutions will depend on this issue, how well they will be able, our higher education institutions, to support individuals on this pathway, to lead their personal learning revolution, and to be a supporter, um, a facilitator, a curator of opportunities uh, for this personal learning revolution. And the third sphere of change um, will happen in organizations, actually. In organizations on the labor market of the world of work. These will become organizations which turn from being hierarchical organizations into completely networked organizations. And graduates of the future, in order to be able to shape those organizations, will have to be reflective social artists. So these are the three fear spheres of change which we discovered and put into our three-sphere model. We developed also a number of what we call future skill profiles, and you can download them as well from the website, which you see here. Uh, we have created little fish <laughs> of uh, future skill, um, so to speak, um, um, profiles, portfolios. Uh, feel free to go there. But there's also a video series, which you can have a look uh, and download our publications. Our research is incorporating uh, an analysis uh, of all up-to-date recent uh, future skill, 21st century skill, key competence uh, frameworks of the last 15 years. Uh, and we have made a synopsis and an inventory uh, of all different skills, which are in these 48, we were selecting 48 uh, different future skill approaches. Uh, and we were creating an inventory uh, and analyzing this inventory uh, according to certain criteria. Um, our research is resulting into 17 individual distinct future skill profiles, which you can see here. Um, so these are things which you might be familiar with. Each of these profiles is containing several reference competencies. That's why they sometimes carry different or funny names, as you can say, De design thinking competence, for example, is rather a title than a competence. And in this category, in this profile, you would find, again, uh, different reference um, uh, competencies. So you have 17 different skill profiles um, and each containing reference uh, competencies. What you can find here is some of them might be familiar to you. Uh, of course, learning literacy is uh, an important one, which we know uh, also digital literacies are important here. Uh, some, uh, by the way, something which many, many future skill uh, approaches are focusing on, on digital literacies. But the future skills, um, which we define as uh, the ability to um, uh, act successfully in an unknown future, in an unknown, complex, and highly emergent future. That's our definition of future skills, to be able to act successfully in an unknown and highly emergent uh, uh, future, where you cannot predict the future, the next step from knowing the past. So you really need uh, competencies which are focusing uh, also on the personal development, like self-determination, self-efficacy, uh, self-competence. What we also did is we found a structure within these 17 uh, future skills. Uh, many of them are focusing on individual development-related skills. Some of them are focusing on the tasks, on the objects of doing, of action. 
um, the work itself, uh, individual object-related skills. And some of them are focusing on the ability of individuals to relate to their social environment, their organizations uh, in which they work. If you distribute this and see the whole picture, you can uh, find it in our publications also. Uh, you see um, uh, how you can, uh, in a way, uh, find a structure. We are currently developing a skill map and a skill finder. And here we take a step into asking the question, how can we actually learn those skills? How can we actually put those skills into online learning? What are pedagogical scenarios, learning designs, which are, su are suitable? And our imagination is that we would like to um, collect good practices for each of these uh, skill profiles from universities uh, and we would like to ask you to support us there uh, and to send us send to us actually um, good examples from your own practice. We would like to push this back into the global community of online learning professionals so that more and more online learning can be oriented towards this kind of thinking and this kind of future skills. Future skill and acting in a highly emergent context is, of course, not the single ability of an individual with regards to their personal development or to their ability to relate to their social world. But it's really, it's really like a triple helix structure in which everything comes together to find a solution for tomorrow's world. In higher education, we often have a reflex when we face new things. We put on top of what we have. Um, we did that with key competence centers in the 90s uh, and also with other new demands which we had. Uh, and our view on this is really that we need in the future a more integrated view. We do not need future skill courses, not 21st century skill courses. We really need to integrate these kind of values, these kind of skills in trainings into the curricula which we have. And the good news is really that in terms of educational approaches, and Palita has talked a lot about this, uh, we have everything uh, which we need, really, since many, many years. We just need to put it into practice. Uh, one very, very good approach is, of course, this one, uh, which come, comes from Harvard professor Mikkel Reisnick, uh, Projects, Passion, Play and Peers, the four big P for uh, learning designs. Uh, another one is, uh, if you see here, Bloom's taxonomy on the left side, uh, moving from knowledge to creation. And you see here future learning, which really aims at creation, analysis, evaluation of scenarios, of knowledge, of developing new knowledge, um, uh, is taking approaches to learning and teaching which have to do with competence and professional development, uh, with taking perspectives um, with teachers who are dialogic learning experts and coaches, uh, active, self-organized, cooperative learning in projects like Palita also talked about problem-based learning, for example. So these are things which are available and we need to put a new focus on that. The new thing is really that there is a completely new relevance. COVID-19 is showing us this completely new relevance. We need to overcome the synchronous reflex. Nobody wants to watch three hours of lecture videos today anymore. We need to really put into place the entire power and the entire horizon of online opportunities to connect learners with each other, with resources, with teachers, with experts, to really guide them into this fascinating world of online learning. We have started just recently to ask our students our students and asking them really, how can we learn of what happens today? You are all learning home. You are all in shutdown. You are all in this crisis um, uh, catalytic moment now. Yeah, Things are stopping. Take this perspective, have a look, 
and tell us about what is your expectation and your view on what we should keep for the future after COVID uh, and what we should improve. So this is a new journey we have just started uh, in form of podcast series. Uh, and we are really happy to share this, uh, I think, at the next, next Eden conference, we have a workshop or a presentation on this issue. I'm coming to the end, and I think that it's really the most important issue that we really start a global coalition to move from this one-dimensional idea and concept of online learning as a transmission tool of knowledge into the next step, into the next sphere, where online learning is a full-fledged, individualized, personalized pathway where educators are curators of opportunities of learning. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm... Thank you. Thank you. Very good presentation. Um, I have a question from you here. Um, we have a question. Why are we always talking about only about skills, not about complete competence? Can you yeah. define? Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, a big discussion. And uh, I think we have written an entire chapter in that in our recent book publication. Um, and the, the issue is uh, rather than focusing on the terminology is really the definition. We define competencies uh, as the ability to act uh, in a complex unknown future situation. And um, we define future skills as a specific set of those competencies. Yeah? Future skills are a selection, a selection of competencies which you need specifically in emergent situations in the future, yeah? when you cannot predict anymore the future from knowing the past. In this situation, these are the, the problem areas for which we try to find skills. Yeah, and one more for you. How uh, Have you found that some of the 17 skills, competencies that you identified were more relevant in some disciplines than others? Or are they relevant across all disciplines in equal measure? No, we are not yet there, actually. we uh, This is a, a question uh, we are now trying to unfold an entire research area. And this is also a call for uh, networking with us, actually, for alliance with us, because um, we see that all over the world, uh, more and more, not only in Australia and Canada, national future skill initi initiatives are um, uh, evolving and emerging, uh, but also on institutional level, we can see that institutions are starting to embrace this idea and give themselves future skill strategies. And we really want to um, work out good practice with this skill finder, which we are going to put on our website. I hope to really uh, show an entrance door, a portal to our research where you in your discipline then also can go and find examples. Okay, I will open now discussion as such. Uh, we have a number of questions in the questions and answer, and you can both look at them. Some of them Ulf, are just for you because they're related to your book and things like that. But now um, let me ask Palita. We have one comment from Kiriakos Lingas. He said, I was struck when my son 11 during online school in a quarantine stated the following, online schools is, is like TV. You can switch off right but you cannot just walk out of the cl classroom, right? So this is about the school as an institution. Its role is socialization in general. So what would be your comment about this? How, how the students are getting this uh, feedback uh, about online education? Please turn on the mic. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think that really brings a really fundamental issue of um, the, the sort of uh, online education um, we are talking about, I think Wolf um, articulated it very well when he was talking about um, the, um, the challenge of uh, moving face-to-face -face teaching to a large group of students and, and engaging a large number of professors as well. Um, I, I think it depends on the kind of 
um, teaching and learning that the school is providing for, for children. I think in this case, it's about uh, education in schools. If the, um, the teaching is done through um, the teacher talking about uh, presenting information through video or audio, uh, and then yes, it, it, you can switch on and off. But I think the, the two examples I, I shared with you, there weren't any, um, in the case of the Uruguay, um, the, the, there were certain element of teaching going on, but the, they had a student had a timetable, uh, the running throughout the whole week, and they they had work to do, um, depending on how much time they can spend. So there wasn't really any kind of switching on and off in those occasions. Um, the parents had to be involved as well, which is one of the challenges, I think. Um, when I was talking to the uh, the, the participant from Uruguay, um, she while I was talking to her, her daughter came and uh, she brought her an iPad. So then she said, excuse me, I had to do something. Then she said she had to get help her daughter to, to log in to use the iPad. So she's actually teaching and and, and the, the, the child was learning as well. Uh, so there are challenges in terms of how much parents uh, had to be, had to get involved. So I think it depends on the, the nature, how the teachers in the school organize the teaching and learning uh, sessions. So sometimes it can be done maybe in the way uh, you can switch on and off, but um, in other cases, it is very much involved, immersed throughout the whole week, I think. Okay, thank you. And we have one more question. Maybe you can, Palita, also start and then uh, Uf can continue on this one. Uh, Maria Kutajar asks, how does digital intelligence configure in all these emotional, cognitive and social? Um, digital intelligence, uh, I think this, this kind of um, requires a little bit of unpacking. I think Wolf can help uh, in this, this regard. I think um, the way I think you can think about this in different ways, one is um, digital literacy skills, digital competencies and, and so on. Um, I think um, I, I don't, yes, I think there is a sense in which um, emotional skills, social emotional skills are left behind, but I think we need to think about those things as well, especially in these, uh, these days when I was talking to teachers. We, we talk to teachers about how they use, how they do this, how they, how they use the online methods for teaching, but some of them were talking that uh, you need to talk to us about our own emotional status as well in these uh, days, um, because you, you got to be kind of working from home, um, depending on the space that, that you have. So I think both are, are important uh, considerations. Um, so maybe I can um, point the question towards uh, Ulf, is that okay? Yeah, okay, Ulf, what's your point on digital intelligence? Um, digital intelligence is an interesting term. I've never heard up to the last uh, 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I can reflect on it uh, in an instant, being very digital intelligent, probably also as reflection on uh, action in uh, digital virtual environments. Um, I would say that uh, for a long time, it resonates with me, we have really taken digital competency, digital literacy, uh, too narrow, actually. And I think that uh, the term digital intelligence is probably a term which relates to the fact um, that digital activities, actions, are um, based on a very, very broad understanding, like the intelligence of a person, a human being in action in their normal world, you know. So, and, and that means we need to think, when we think about digital intelligence, about many, many dimensions. And I like this notion, uh, which I now reflect on. I hope that's what the person was meaning, actually. Um, uh, that that uh, we need to unpack this uh, term uh, in, in, in that way, and that it's a very, very broad concept, actually, which is not just creating, uh, not just uh, encompassing the... the um, Okay. Uh, consumption, but also production, mm. organization, critical action. 
uh, and so on. Okay, uh, let's move to another question. We have a question from Mahad Ali. He says, in the 21st century, where there is information explosion and use of OER, education will be learner-centered rather than teacher-centered. It is important to look at the 21st century skills from the learner-centered education rather than teacher-centered. So how much teachers should know and prepare their lectures for learner-centered uh, uh, education and how much are students and children prepare for, for this way of, of learning? So, Polita, maybe you can start. Yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, that's again a very interesting question, I think. Um, so, I think in, in this case, I think in any case, um, it is important for teachers to have a certain kind of philosophy in terms of what learning is, what, what teaching is, um, and, and what learning is. So I think it all depends on the teacher's understanding of, of that kind of uh, what sort of view they have. So um, I think the teachers, um, regardless of whether um, uh, the number of resources that are available, I think it will be quite often difficult for students to um, do their own learning activities um, on their own. I think and, and maybe it might be possible um, if the learner is quite an intelligent or somebody who has well-developed learning um, um, skills. So a lot of the, I, I think research show that a lot of people who are um, engaging in open educational resources and MOOCs and so on, they are quite well-educated um, people, although they are, they, they, they are not supposed to be for a particular group of people. So um, I think teacher has a role, I think, in, in terms of um, helping, guiding students to choose and develop some kind of a learning pathway. But I think after a while, they, their role should be a much more like a, a guide on the side or somebody who is um, helping um, and then um, keeping, um, providing a more guiding role rather than directing too much. I think the, the example I have shown from the Swiss Switzerland teacher from Switzerland, I think there is a lot of what he said was um, we should not be in front of the teach students all the time teaching and um, um, asking them to listen to you. And also the same with the teacher from Uruguay as well. Her philosophy was not one of, um, oh, I, I know a lot of information and you go to listen to me and then you're going to learn. I think uh, moving away from that kind of philosophy, but while um, while keeping an eye, I think giving some sort of a guidance and also that they we will have a role in terms of assessing as well, creating the right kind of learning environment. Okay, thank you, Paulita. Both your comment versus teacher-centered, learner-centered education? Yeah, I think that um, um, we need a new dialogue between these two groups. We really need a new dialogue because we, I'm, I'm, I'm chairing a, a group of European ministries uh, on the future of teaching and learning. And, and I can see there actually that we are focusing our discussions around what should be our future role. You know, where are we? Are we there? Are we not there? Are we in the picture? Are we not in the picture? Do we lose our positions? Do we not lose them or not? Now, I think that teaching and learning requires both the learner and the teacher, of course, but constantly in changing environments and roles and identities. Um, in our future skill work, we have defined four future university scenarios. One is, for example, a scenario which is called the lifelong learning scenario, which says that in the next 15 years, universities will move from an upfront preparation model to a lifelong guidance by the side model. That means the bachelor and the master will just be an initial phase. And then afterwards, education, academic education is increasing, not decreasing over the last time. Yeah? So that means that educators need to be curators of opportunities along the episodical uh, biographical uh, lifelong learning. Another scenario is a scenario which we call multi-institutional study pathways. So a student in University A is not graduating from University A, but throughout, throughout their studies, 
is taking a course through different campus, different institutions, different courses, different study opportunities. And again, um, the idea of the autonomous learner is much more in focus there. And teachers are very important, but they have a completely different role than being the definitory place and position uh, in which it is defined when I have to learn what, in which quantity, intensity, uh, and measure, and how am I assessed against that. Yeah. So, so this is, I think, uh, an important conversation we need to lead, but not in a polarized way that we say teachers need to keep their role and learners need to be more important, but it's really a new dialogue, a new alliance which we need. Yeah, thank you, Ulf. I have a question from you, from your former student. He says, I was your student back in 2010 at Umuk MD in US. So his question is, uh, uh, one of your slides mentioned that one of 21st century is more alignment with employability. How do you see that happen in an online teaching environment? Well, um, it's always a danger or an opportunity to have a past student there. <laughs> this, in this case, he seemed to be <laughs> seems to be constructive. Um, well, um, I think that that um, that's yeah one one challenge we are facing actually in right in our in my university where I'm working, uh, we have four. Um, strategic goals for online uh, digital transformation. And one is really, uh, how can we use the question, how can we use to bridge the academic learning and study uh, location and the world of work? Uh, and I think this is something where we are still, even in today's world, are not having enough experience, made enough experience on. We are still having a bit of touchy relation, you know, between this academics and this world of work. And the, the world of work actors are not really having a very good opinion often, uh, or always, uh, of, of the academics and don't think they really understand what they are talking about and the other way around. And I think we need to bridge this. And the, the, the presupposition is really that we create a culture of understanding and dialogue. Also here, actually, uh, and that we are able then to use technology to really understand that learning is nothing which is um, encapsulated into the university, into the academic environment. It is really something where, from the learner's perspective, which happens all the time, and we as companies, as employers, and as academic institutions, need to collaborate to support this learning in an ideal, seamless way. Okay, thank you, Polita. I have a question from you, for you from uh, YouTube as well. So Yun Hao Chen is asking, if students feel lonely in their studies, how to solve this problem? How to motivate them? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's also quite an interesting or very important question, I think, especially these days. Uh, a lot of us are working from home and students are learning from home as well. Um, and that is quite a common occurrence because um, they would not have chance to talk to their friends as they would normally do. And when I ask, I, I'm doing some research with colleagues from China as well. When I uh, was asking students, what, what do you expect? The first thing um, when you go back to school and the thing, the first thing comes is um, uh, meet friends. And that's the only thing they were saying that, um, that they are missing from schools and apart from teachers as well. Um, so um, I think in the examples I um, mentioned, it, it, they, 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 were, they were doing certain things and it was not perfect and it's not possible to create um, the kind of face-to-face -face environment that people are usually um, used to, especially for children. Uh, without friends, that's, that's a very difficult thing for them to um, handle. So um, uh, in the examples I showed, they, the teachers have created learning activities where they can talk to each other. Um, so this is all again um, using online methods and the learning activities involved 
working with small groups and uh, the Swiss teacher, Switzerland teacher, what he said was uh, the, the students were um, chatting to each other all the time while they are doing home, their, 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 their school work. Um, and also um, uh, the teachers would have a group, a tutorial group class with everybody um, almost every day. And I mean, this kind of things uh, create a lot more work for the teacher. And what he said was um, he's working until about seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the evening some days. Uh, and so a lot more work for the teacher, but there are that kind of opportunities they create for students do not, or at least reduce the amount of loneliness they feel. But that is a really important issue. Okay, uh, we are coming to, to the end of uh, our session. Uh, I have a final question for both of you. Uh, meaning, um, Ulf, in your presentation, you said we have to make the shift to move to move to 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 a different sphere of learning and and, and thinking about how to do, to uh, to produce uh, teaching and learning how to engage students more actively how to change from this you know teacher centered where we transfer the knowledge where we uh, working in the classroom so actually covid brought us the challenge uh, we moved through over the night to online but things are going a little bit to back to, to normal, some kind of normal. Teachers and students are not so eager to stay on fully online. They would like a little bit to go back and not to use everything that was done before. So actually to shift, to make this shift, what should be done? What steps do we need to make in order to make this shift so that teachers and students get skills that will enable them to easily move to this shift, to, to make it to, so that it will be more naturally for them. I have made a big question from it, but I, I think you understand what, what, what is my point. So maybe Ulf, you can start. Yeah, I try to try to make a, a short answer, which will not answer the question, but dimension it into, in, in, into its parts. Um, I think that, that we can look at this question, what has to be done uh, from uh, a policy, uh, let's say a macro view, from an institutional, a meso view, and from a, from a learning and teaching view, from a learning design view, from a micro view. And uh, just colleagues, just, just look at it from the macro view. Yeah? Uh, five years ago, LinkedIn, which has 550 million users now, um, uh, uh, announced that they will be the new university because they have skill profiles of everybody. They have a skill path explorer built right now and they know what are job profiles demands. So they can give you everything. In the same week, um, the CEOs of IBM, Google and HP were announcing that bachelor certificates from universities are having no prognostic uh, power in their recruiting processes anymore, but that they will need proof of what people can really do and have experienced, what LinkedIn announced a week before they can do. So if we want not to be marginalized in the future, we need to shift. We need to take this seriously, actually. Yeah? And, and that's the environment in which we are. Uh, and COVID and climate crisis and migration challenges and whatever kind of uh, things are coming up, this will serve as, as, as an accelerator of these kind of developments. And this will hit us on a meso level, on the institutional level, and will ask the question, what are your strategies to support inter-institutional study pathways, to support uh, personalization, lifelong learning scenarios, like I said it before, uh, in a better way than you did that before. And that's the break up of the university, how we know it, and that's the turn towards more digital integration uh, which, because other, other than that, we will not be able to really facilitate that. And then all of us, you, me, all of us, we are the community, we are the academics, we are the university, and we are the society. 
And we need to take care that this is not happening in a way which we would ethically not appreciate. And that's why it's so important that we all form an alliance and work on this issue very, very intensely. Thank you. Really good. Palita, what would be your reply to this final question? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Just just building on um, connecting with what, uh, what Ulf, uh, was, was, uh, Ulf's remarks. Um, yes, I think um, there, there ought to be a shift and um, how we can make it more natural. But I think as human beings, I think um, we all have seen how we change our behavior last few months, I think. Um, I don't know whether you were following, anyone of you were following news in the UK and how, how reluctant the government was, uh, our government in the UK uh, was to take some of the measures and they were really worried whether people will change and follow the advice apart from few people who didn't follow the advice, uh, which you all know as well. Anyway, so, um, um, so I think we have, a, we have time, I think in our university as well, we are at the moment planning for um, the, the, the teaching and learning, how it is going to happen in September and then from January and next um, year and, and so on. So um, we, we can think about um, what, what, it is, um, what it is that we want to offer to our students and what it is that students are expecting from us, um, from a university and how we can change the mode of operation um, from completely face-to-face -face into some sort of gradually to um, online blended and seamless between the two and trying to identify what is the face-to-face -face element can offer and how we can uh, can do it. And it is happening uh, in the society as well. The um, restaurants and pubs, bars and uh, uh, shops and everywhere, we, they're, they're, they're rethinking about how how they provide this service in a different way. I think educational institutions can do as well. Thank you, Paulita. Thank you for being my guest today, for joining me for the last session before, before the summer. Uh, I'm very happy that we have done this uh, series uh, uh, of webinars. They have brought really huge uh, number of participants from all over the world. We plan to move again with these webinars in autumn. But before that, we have the inner annual conference. Uh, uh, it will be online from 22nd to 24th. So I ask all of you to join and to follow different, similar and uh, different uh, uh, topics uh, uh, on, on, on present issues. Also, I would like to invite you to follow Eden and Up webinar, which will, which will be on Wednesday. Uh, the topic is of inclusion, uh, and uh, let me see. I just uh, I just have it here the accessibility inclusion in time of pandemic. So um, thank you, my colleagues. Uh, thank you, Lisa and Diana, for being in back uh, and helping us. Uh, and I wish to see you all at Eden Conference in Timshuara online Timshuara from twenty second to twenty fourth. Thank you. See you. Bye.